Welcome to Search Institute's uh, webinar. We are really excited to be with you today. Thanks for spending your morning with us. I know how busy life is, and um, we are grateful that you chose to be with us this morning. Um, I wanted to tell you just a few things as we get started. One is we've uh, disabled the, 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 the chat. So if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A section. Uh, we have two amazing people, uh, uh, Justin and Mary, uh, that are uh, behind the, the curtain answering questions. Um, both with uh, uh, invaluable experience with developmental assets that many of you know if, you, if you've partnered with Search Institute. So please uh, um, put those in the chat as, we, as you have questions that come up. Um, I'm also really excited because we have um, the opportunity to really talk about our latest data on developmental assets. And one thing that I want to say as I think about Search Institute and who we are um, is that we can only accomplish our mission in partnership with you all, the heroes of the story, the people on the ground every day doing the work uh, with young people. Uh, I am very excited uh, to, to do this today as a, a long time um, observer and uh, uh, practitioner who used developmental assets back in the uh, late uh, or well, early 2000s, um, and now as the CEO and president of Search Institute. Um, and uh, I'm also excited because we'll have Catherine Tate from the Legacy Center uh, in Michigan and uh, Heidi Kame uh, with Hope, Hopewell Valley Mun Municipal Alliance, and she's in New Jersey. And they've been using the developmental assets for over 20 years each, and they have rich experience. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our data, about where we are right now. Um, and then later on in the hour, we'll be bringing them on uh, to, to talk with us. So um, I'm going to share my screen and, um, and let's, let's get started. As we think about the history of what the developmental assets are, I wanna make sure I set them in context. We can go back and think about at a time in, in, the, in, in the 90s in particular, where positive youth development began to grow, where there were many thinkers on the ground in prevention science, uh, but also um, people across the, the, the nation that we're beginning to ask the question and talk about uh, the idea that young people are not problems to be solved, that they are not the, the defined by their risks or challenges in their lives, but that there are assets, there are things that they have around them in their community and in them that make a big difference that can be uh, uh, utilized and harnessed right now to make the world a better place. And as that momentum began to build with many people at the forefront of that, including Search Institute, the developmental assets were birthed and they began to, to, to spread across the nation and really into the world. When we think about ways that we can begin to build assets for the young people so that they can be in communities where they thrive. Now, that history of time as we uh, go through positive youth development, um, it, it, it's, it's been now over 30 years uh, as we think about uh, the, the impact of the positive youth development movement. And I think that we're at this time right now where the same messaging, uh, uh, the, the ways that we think about young people in a time in the world where we're polarized at times, where people are split and, and, and we get caught up in all of the things that are going on wrong in our world, that we have to come back to and center ourselves around the idea that all young people have potential right now to impact the world that they live in. And sometimes as adults, we can frame things through, the, through a negative deficit lens still today that rubs off on the young people that we serve. 
Now, I know that it's a challenging time. We have just gone through a pandemic. We have uh, seen inequities emerge in new ways because of the pandemic. But we're at a time in history right now where we can begin to come together to shift the narrative back to recognizing what are those assets and how can we build those together to really allow our young people to thrive. And when we think about assets, I know some of you come to this conversation possibly as not knowing much about developmental assets. And then many of you have been a part of our community and in partnership for decades. And, and so I want us to think about the importance of assets um, in, in both those who have, have a, a, a rich understanding of what developmental assets are and those that are maybe learning about them for the first time. Peter Benson, the late great Peter Benson and, and, and uh, one of our previous CEOs of Search Institute says in his TEDx talk that youth are not vessels to be filled, but fires to be lit. And I love this statement because we can often think that we have to put things, uh, 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 we have to help young people get things, that we have to put things in them, that we have to, that we have to change them. And instead, when we think about the idea of developmental assets, we have to start to say, how do we draw out those internal assets that they have in their lives already, those sparks, those things that light them up, those sense of purpose that we're seeing emerge all over the country today to solve real community issues? And then how can we create the context that the, the, how can we be architects of the context that really creates thriving communities for our young people? And that's what developmental assets are. That we've been studying developmental assets for decades now. We've had almost over 5 million young people complete the developmental assets survey. Um, we know that we can look at correlations over time and we can look at the ways that the more assets that people have in their lives that young people have around them and that they discover in themselves, uh, the better off they are for, for thriving in their lives. But we also have to recognize that the developmental assets were really built for practitioners that there's a common sense to them to get a, a view of what are the assets across the ecology of a young person, of, of what is in their communities, what is in their families, what is in their schools, what is in their youth development programs, um, what are the assets around them that enable them uh, to give them opportunity to thrive. And this shift is a really important shift that was important uh, 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 in the, the, the turn of the century. But it's even as we think about it today, it becomes really critical for us to come together again and ask this question. What are the assets that we can build together in communities, in schools, in families that allow the young people that we serve to truly thrive. Now, the same idea of thinking about this positive narrative or this, this strength-based narrative, when that when we were when positive youth development began to emerge, we also know that there was more and more data that was coming out around the, the, the negative impact of adverse circumstances for children. That when we acknowledge and we talk about the strength-based approach and we hold on to the unwavering truth that all young people have potential and they're not defined by their risks, we also cannot minimize the pain, the struggles, and the difficulties that many of the youth that we serve face. And that we know that adversity can come in these pairs and that these pairs of, at an individual level that get under the skin and impact us all the way down to a molecular level, that they have widespread impact on the emotional and the physical and the social health of the young people we serve. And we also know that communities have experienced trauma. 
The communities have experienced adversity that, that over time, historically and traditionally, when, when groups have been marginalized or there's barriers for their thriving that undermine their health, that it impacts them in deep ways. And we're at this time right now where we have to hold on to both of these truths, the challenges and adversities and difficulties that are disproportionately experienced are part of the pain story and narrative. But we also have to understand the, the strength-based resilience narrative as well. And I want to talk about how we hold these two weights and what we see in our data as we move for, uh, forward as a society and hopefully call to an action that we can come together as a group that is not based on politics, is not based on differences, but begins to say, what are the fundamentals that we can agree on together? And how do we work together in collective action to create change for the young people that we serve? And these are some of the fundamental principles that I believe we all can get behind. That all youth, all young people, all children are entitled to being seen, heard, and valued. That when they walk into the space, they are known that they are seen as, as, as people of worth, that they have something to offer to this world. And also that they're safe, that there's predictability. And finally, that there's just access to basic resources. These are the fundamental principles in some of the ordinary processes that are required of creating resilience communities. And they're, in, they're woven into our DNA or into the way that we function from the very time we are born, that we have a need to say, am I worthy and am I safe? And worthy is answered by the question of love, of relationships, of being known, and safety is by trustworthiness, the way we show up, no matter what. And then finally, we know the importance of just access. And so these become the fundamental principles that we can begin to rally around as the ordinary magic of thinking about promoting resilience. But we also know that we have to go further. And what we have found in our research is even though these are the basics of the fundamentals of knowing uh, uh, that we are worthy and valued and safe, that when we uh, uh, surveyed about 15,000 young people, middle school and high schoolers, that only two out of 10 strongly agreed that they felt known and valued. How do we begin to think about helping create spaces and places where young people truly know they belong and truly recognize that they are known and valued. And we know that, adversi by, that uh, adversities and challenges and, and, and people's lives and communities, of li uh, uh, communities often undermine feeling known and valued. But we also know that that is not the whole story. I'm going to get to the assets, but I want to create the framework of this because I think it's really uh, critical as we go into the assets to know that the developmental assets can have to be taken into, into context of the communities in which you serve. And we know from data, we know uh, uh, from uh, data that was released from the CDC and several other places, we've heard this over and over now, that our young people are having challenges with their mental health. Anybody serving young people right now have this understanding and this felt need that they've experienced with young people. And in our own data with our developmental assets survey, we see the same theme emerge. 
that when we look at data from uh, uh, 2016 up to the pandemic, and then from the pandemic to, to right now, what we have found in our trends of the data of about 150,000 young people is we have seen this decrease in this feeling and experience of being able to overcome adversity, to maintain their good health, this, this increase of, of feelings of, of depression and isolation and hopelessness, and even an increase in eating disorders. We are at a fundamental time in history where developmental assets and being champion of assets across the community could not be more important. Now, it's really hard to be all things to all kids at all times as an individual, but as a community, we can. As a community, we can begin to think about this balancing of sitting with people and their pain and understanding that there are real barriers for people that we serve, particularly communities of color, and that that's not the whole story. And that there are also assets and strengths and, and ways that we can begin to shape that narrative to help young people to thrive. And this is the essence of what we know from resilience theory. The resilience is not a mindset, it's a community. And that we know that when there's risks and there's challenges and there's, there's difficulties, that we also have to begin to expand the protective processes across the ecosystem of young people. That we're able to harness those things that are internally sparking young people, and we're able to be builders of communities around us and, and connectors to create safety nets of protection and assets that allow our young people to thrive. That we all play a role in that. And this is the essence of developmental assets. That when we think about developmental assets as the supports and the opportunities, and the relationships that young people need in, the, in all aspects of their lives, we begin to think about becoming connectors. That when I serve a young person, I'm, 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 I'm also not just thinking about the ways that I can impact their lives through my relationships, but I want to know, I want to be an investigator of what is around them. Who are the people in their lives that, get, that help empower them? Who are the people in their lives that set the boundaries and the, the, the support roles? Where are those existing in our communities? That the daunting task of the schools today or the daunting task of the teacher is to hear the idea that you need to do more. And we know that that can be unrealistic for so many people that are in the field that are working so hard every day with the youth workers and the schools, but we can get disconnected in our own silos of this work. And what we have to recognize is there might be assets in our community that we can connect young people to in ways that increases their social capital, in ways that increases that relational network, that impacts their lives in positive ways that there are these external assets of support and empowerment and boundaries and expectations and giving youth space and time and places for constructive use of their time, for opportunities for their sparks to grow into prover those, that proverbial fire. I'll never forget some of the kids that I saw come alive as a licensed marriage and family therapist, that once I got that sense of their spark, of what they cared about, and it began to get connected to opportunity. That the world opened up. And that I remember being honored by the incredible stories of resilience and, and, and thriving that happened even in the midst of adversity as I walked alongside the young people that I served. We have to think about a more systemic approach to understanding how to impact communities to create the change that can be lasting for our young people today. What are their external assets that they have in their environment? What are the things around them? 
And then what internally, what are those things that's, that, that, that they're committed to when we think about their learning and we think about their the positive values and, and what they come to the table. And we've heard a lot about this importance of social emotional competencies, which is absolutely important as we think about social emotional learning. But those are, those, are, those are created by the conditions and the environment often. And if we can begin to think about creating those conditions that intersect with building these social emotional competencies, and we can do that collectively, we can also see the powerful movement. And then finally, positive identity, the sense of who I am. Who am I and where do I belong in this world? That these eight broader categories over time really emerged as the, 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 the broader assets or, or, or things that we know can be really critical for young people. And so I'm gonna skip through this poll because I wanna go through some of the assets first. I wanna think about with you, just giving you kind of a snapshot. And I want you to think about your young people that you serve. That when we look at these together, we've talked about averages of the total assets. When we think about the 40 assets with these eight kind of broader categories, that the average of assets from 2016 to now have not changed much for us. But the distributions of these have changed. And this is a lot of data right here that I'm going to kind of break down really quickly. But for those of you that are the, the searchies, the people that have been doing assets for a while, I wanted you to see this. For those of you that are new to it, I want you just to pay attention to some of the themes. That when we look at changes in our external assets and we orient ourselves to this, the ones that are in that kind of blue color are the ones that actually were strengthened from 2016 to now. And the one that we see that we hear about is this positive peer influence, that young people have turned to each other in ways that are new and unexpected from the time of the pandemic and the challenges they face. And we've seen some decreases as well in the sense of safety and opportunity for service to other and engagement in religious communities and youth programming. And, and But with our internal assets, what we've seen is really major shifts that matches some of the story that I told early on. That what we have found is both the positives that have come from this, this over this, this year, some increases in things that have heightened this kind of um, uh, sense of, of, of importance of justice and equity and, and, and cultural competence and valuing of diversity and the sense of caring has, has increased from 2016 to 2022. Now, this is really important. The young people are prime right now to do good in the communities that they live and they breathe and they act. And we also know the risk side of this, that if you've worked with young people, you've seen some of the challenges that have happened at the, at the, uh, posit at the identity level, that we've seen decreases in the sense of personal power or agency, in this sense, this general sense of self, global self-esteem or self-worth and decreases in a sense of purpose and, and, and this positive view of the personal future. What are the narratives that we're shaping for our young people's future right now? Are we acknowledging and recognizing spaces for them to dream, to hope, to see the way that they can change the world and giving opportunity and creating spaces for this. This becomes important as we think about our work ahead. I want to do just a really quick poll here because I would love to hear your thoughts on this as you think about the people that you serve. And as you think about those broader categories, so let's just do a quick poll to ask this question, which asset category do you consider to be of greatest importance among the young people that you serve? Um, and so we're gonna put this up right now. Please uh, pick, pick what you think is um, the asset court, uh, category that you think is, is, is of the greatest importance right now. I'm seeing, Multiple answers, uh, those numbers are climbing. 
Uh, I love to see it. Um, give some more time to this. We're at over 400 people right now. Over 500 people. Just a few more moments. For the sake of time, we're at about 85%. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the poll now. And I want to share the results. As you look at this data, you can see that about 26% of you, but most of you really see the most important thing as support and empowerment. And I think that that's really a, 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 a critical uh, um, uh, view of what many of the experts in this space right now that are that is you on the ground doing the work of saying what's important for our young people today. Did you see that? Let me actually show it here. I, I might not. You might not have seen that. I hope you can see that now. So, how do we go forward as we think about this? What are the ways that we can begin to think about assets? And then how can we create change right now as well? Well, developmental assets gives us a great broad view across the ecologies of young people. And we know that over the last decade, we spent even more time thinking about what Peter Benson called the oxygen of youth development too. And that, and that Kent Pickell built on in his time as CEO of, of beginning to dive deeper into what are the elements? What are the things that matter for young people? How do we create relationships that make the difference? Because you can expand assets, but young people also need the quality relationships that move beyond just the, the, the basics of support and, 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 and positivity, but also how do we begin to help shape the ways that they in, it, it interact with themselves and their own sense of identity, the ways that they feel that self-efficacy to, to, to act on the gifts that they have in their lives and make contributions in, in, in their communities right now. And this comes through relationships that we cannot overstate the importance of this. And this is an extension of our work that we will continue to update and build and understand the assets in, in kids' lives and in youth's lives at a broad level across ecologies. And then we also want to cultivate developmental relationships within the spaces and the places that they leave, live and breathe as we wanna provide these five elements so that they can have the opportunities to then create the change that we know is so possible when we empower the young people we serve today. That we are drawing these out of them in a way that impacts the world that we live in today. And so you've heard me talk about this. You've heard me think about uh, 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 where Search Institute has gotten some broad understanding from the data. And there's caveats to that data, of course, because we're looking at the aggregate and we're looking at it in the broader sense. But I also wanna narrow it down to particular situations and cases that are within organizations of how this work is done on a daily basis. And so I'm really excited about our guest today as we transition to really have a conversation about developmental assets and the way that they've impacted um, these wonderful leaders in the youth development space. So I have Heidi Coleman from, who's a coordinator at Hope, Hopewell Valley Municipal Alliance from New Jersey, and then Catherine Tate, the president and CEO of Legacy Center um, in Midland, Michigan. And so I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna bring them on and please give them a, a, a round of applause and we'll pretend that we're hearing it as if we're in a stadium right now. So um, thank you so much, Heidi and Catherine for, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here, thanks, Ben. I was struck in our conversations uh, before even coming into uh, this call today. Uh, and I feel like we could have probably just recorded that time together. Um, and one of the things that I would love to hear uh, from both of you 
is kind of your story of coming to understand this idea of developmental assets and why it resonated so much with you personally, with both of you having 20 plus years experience of, 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 of understanding developmental assets and being around it. And so tell, tell us a little bit about your story. And we'll start with you, Heidi, of, of uh, coming to this developmental assets understanding and, and why it, it resonated with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so our organization um, has been using the developmental asset model for the last uh, 26 years. We just celebrated 26 years. And really how the program or how the whole framework came to our community was pretty simple. Um, back in 1995, we took um, had our community through our school district take the National Drug Survey. And the headlines of the newspapers read, Hopewell Valley scores high in drugs. And our superintendent at the time, uh, needless to say, I'm sure was very nervous about that headline and had learned about the Search Institute and the 40 developmental asset model as um, protective factors. So it was actually his idea to bring the 40 developmental asset model to our community. And in 1995 was when we, uh, actually 96 is when we did our first survey and we just shared it with the broader community. We brought people together to the table. We said, look, we realized, you know, our headlines have read this. We need to address it. Um, we brought, oh gosh, I'd say probably about 70 people together in our community, um, all walks of life within our community, clergy members, first responders, et cetera, and just said, we need to roll up our sleeves and work on um, what's happening in our community with our kids. Awesome. So really, um, that that I, I can't wait to just un, like really think about how you experienced developmental assets and thinking about it from, from the historical standpoint of when it started and launching it and really creating a collaborative and, 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 and a community around it that's embedded in the DNA of what you do. And, 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 and hear a little bit about the way the changes have happened over the last several years. Can, can you, we'll, we'll get to that next after we kind of talk to Catherine too, but can you quickly also talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the families and the youth that you serve? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, where, where those um, people are that you serve and, and, and just the, the general um, sense that you've experienced in the communities that you serve right now? Yeah, so um, we're a relatively small community. Um, we are kind of encumber three municipalities. We're only about 22,000 people. We serve about um, 2,500 uh, school families. But um, I I'd say the people that we focus most of our attention on are those that we sort of find are a little bit more marginalized. Um, we have an amazing school district that's been able to help identify those students. And I think we really like to work closely with them and almost do a little bit of a sort of asset analysis with each of those individuals and sort of determine, you know, what are some of the assets that those young people are missing and how can we better, you know, serve them and to build those assets. So um, we have a very supportive parent community, which is terrific. So we've been able to have a lot of community discussions since we just surveyed our students on how we can better build um, assets within our children. So it's been um, it's been really great. If we didn't have a supportive community, I wouldn't be able to do this work. So yeah. very awesome. fortunate. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Catherine, I know you you especially over the last you, you all have been uh, really able to collect longitudinal data uh, on developmental assets, but you also have uh, a a cool story of coming to know developmental assets. So why don't you talk a little bit about that history for you, and then it, also tell us a little bit about the, the communities that you serve. Sure. Um, so I'll just say quickly on a personal level, when I was about 17 years old in Fort Wayne, Indiana, my dad was on a committee called Success by Six, and he came home with this sheet of developmental assets, and we'd never heard of it before, and he handed it to me, and he said, hey, how many of these do you think you have? And it kind of sparked a conversation and it got me thinking about it. And it kind of stuck with me over the years. So when the Legacy Center was hiring six years ago and I saw that they were involved with developmental assets, I was like, wait a second, life just came full circle. Um, so our agency- I, I love that. I love that story. I just think it was a, as a parent now, like it's a pretty vulnerable place to put yourself in. How many assets do you have right now that are, <laughs> that's great, yeah. 
Well, fortunately, I was blessed with a lot of support and activities that kept me connected with positive peers. So I was in a pretty good place at the time. Um, but our agency actually started this work back in about 2004, 2005, when we were first founded. So we're just shy of 20 years of doing this work in our community. Um, and it really started with um, our founder, who's his name is Dr. Dick Delinsky. And Dick is, um, he's a scientist and a philosopher. So, and he worked for the chemical industry for years here in Midland. And when he retired, he really was struck by what is it that ha that causes some kids to be very successful in life and what prevents kids from not seeking, from not reaching their full potential. And it was that question that sparked our work in developmental assets and really started with um, working with our local juvenile court back in 2004, five and six in the early days. And Judge Doreen Allen invited um, the Legacy Center in to start measuring the number of developmental assets that kids in our juvenile care center had. And over time, um, she really crafted programs for these kids that focus on building developmental assets. And we saw through her um, court wards, we saw growth, we saw a reduction in the number of kids in the court system, we saw fewer kids um, or fewer cases of recidivism. And it really started to build the case in our community for why this is valuable. So we actually did our first countywide attitudes and behaviors survey back in uh, December of 2005. And from that point forward, we have measured about every five years to see how um, how our assets are changing, where are we where are we struggling, where are our opportunities to grow, and where are we doing really well. And what's been really cool in our community is that this community has embraced it. This community is um, a, it's a robust, rich community of nonprofits and caring caring providers who want to see our kids thrive. Mm -hmm. And when this came to them as here's evidence of how we can help our kids thrive, our United Way embraced it. All of our nonprofits now um, that work with kids have to be able to show that they're building developmental assets. Our schools embraced it. It's become woven into our into the fabric of our community, and it's part of our language here. And with that, you know, we actually saw significant growth in developmental assets between our first, second, and third surveys. Mm. We've seen some interesting changes since COVID, but we have that longitudinal lens. And that's really cool now to tell that story because I can say, look at what happened when we were really invested in developmental assets, look at where we are today. And now we have a path forward. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, Catherine. I would, let's stay right there and, and, and um, dig in a little bit to that. As, um, as you mentioned, kind of the, some of the changes that you, that you have, um, uh, experience and as you see the kind of more broader data that I presented today, I would love to hear your uh, your take on what what are some of those things that have changed. What have you noticed? What are some maybe some surprises? What are things that that you've seen shift um, in the data? Uh, and then Heidi will come to you and have you kind of talk about that as well. Yeah, I was um, frantically scratching down notes as you went through all of your data to see how we compare over time. Um, we did survey back in December of 2015, so that was a pretty close date to your past survey, aggregate survey results, and then we surveyed in um, October of 2021, so we were still fairly close in the throes of the pandemic. We were just in that first semester back um, into our, I don't know, quasi-normal year, if you will, um, and our kids were still struggling. So back in 2016, our kids had more developmental assets than uh, the aggregate. We, on average, had 21.9 developmental assets per child. Now, that is an increase of two assets on average per youth since we started surveying. So we've seen really nice growth during those three surveys. But then when um, COVID hit, we expected to see some drops. And then I want to also point out that our community had like this one-two punch because while we were still in the lockdown from the very early part of COVID, we also had a 500-year flood when dams broke near our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had like home loss. We had just massive trauma for our, our community. Mm -hmm. um, so we really had a one-two punch and we surveyed about six months after that, um, after that flood. Um, 
And so what we found was we were almost back down to normal, um, to what, I'm sorry, to what we started with back in 2006. In, in our actually, um, our number of average assets is equal to the, what the, to what the search institute aggregate says. So we went from being slightly above that to being on par with. So we had a, a pretty deep drop. Um, we were expecting to see drops in developmental assets. We expected a lot of the external assets to go down. We didn't have as many opportunities for kids during that period of time. We were uh, very surprised to see um, positive peer influence actually went up for yeah. us. And then we saw some, um, we actually saw some of the same growth that you saw on the um, the equality and social justice and those kinds of things. Okay. One of the biggest surprises for us, and I'll do it really quick here, was that we we expected that older kids, like seniors, juniors, who are like at the prime of their high school period, would see the biggest dip in developmental assets. And what the data told us, and this is why data is so important, the data told us that sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders took the biggest hit in developmental assets. Mm -hmm. So that was really surprising to us, but it's also, they were in those formative years before peers become their primary influencer. They didn't have the same opportunities to be right. built up. Interesting. So that was, that was probably the most striking thing for us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, I love that, that the way that you talk about data to dialogue, to action, right? Where you can use data in a way that has a conversation and then you can actually think of ways to, to intervene. So I wanna come back to that, Catherine, and hear what you did with that data when it came to that sixth, seventh and eighth grade group. Heidi, from your experience of being in the field, can, can you just talk about maybe some of the things that you have noticed uh, or uh, some of the practitioners and teachers and the people that you work with have noticed with youth when we talk about changes in assets? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, also, um, just like Catherine was looking at um, the Search Institute data, we almost mirrored that when we have done previous surveys. So um, definitely where the fluctuations were, were the same for us. I would say one of our biggest surprises um, was in the positive identity category. Um, and I had to think about, and we've thought about as a community, you know, what, what does that mean? You know, this positive sense of future, um, you know, certainly with the pandemic that didn't help. Um, so I think a lot of our young people are struggling with that. Some of the other things that we've learned um, as far as support, which is very interesting, is that with our young people, there's a tremendous amount of um, family support, but when it comes to family communication, it's way down. And so we've been talking as, as clinicians in the community that we call it um, sort of mirror play or, or, you know, parents are on the couch, you know, everyone's on their cell phone. They may all be together with their kids in one room, but nobody's communicating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there aren't really those many opportunities, but yet the kids do feel like there's a tremendous amount of support in their families, but they're not communicating. So you know, putting sort of assets into action, we're hoping to be bringing a lot of programming uh, around uh, building positive family relationships and communication. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so valuable about the survey data is that it really gives communities an opportunity to address what they see in that data. And fortunately, we've been very, very lucky to have a number of community representatives that are willing to give their time to support and educate our parents. Um, and some of the other things that I think in our community with regards to COVID, and I think we've talked about this in our uh, previous meeting, was just the um, sort of deterioration, unfortunately, because of COVID at the maturity level. So, you know, we were finding that a lot of our young people were years behind in maturity um, and socializing, yet academically they were fine. So I think that might have a lot to do with why we saw our positive um, identity category, you know, sort of much lower than than what we were hoping for. Um, so although I agree with the community that is here today that, you know, support and empowerment are super important, I don't want to lose sight, though, of uh, positive identity. I, I really feel um, in our community that's something that we really need to focus on. Yeah. yeah and can, yeah. can I hop in and yeah. echo that? Please. I'm sorry. Please, um, I want to just echo, we saw the same shifts with positive identity issues 
One of the things that Legacy Center does with our data is that we do a regression analysis to look at each risk-taking behavior against each developmental asset and look at the relationship and, and the strength of relationship between each asset and each risk behavior. And we hadn't really looked at that closely with regard to the mental health um, risk behaviors. So when we ran that, I want to point out that we found two developmental assets had the strongest relationship of all assets to any risk behavior in our community. Those two for mental health were sense of purpose and self-esteem, mm -hmm. positive identity assets. So those two factors seem to be a huge, have a huge relationship to our kids' mental health. Yeah. Just yeah. No, that, that. I think those are, that is so that there, there's two threads I think that are are really uh, I want to kind of go to talk about more. One is both of you mentioned really creating shared understanding, a shared language with in order to unite and connect um, the community around and uh, uh, around a way to to really work together to impact young people. And then and then this this conversation around positive uh, identity that this this sense of like worth and value and this idea uh, that I have something to offer to the world and purpose is at the core of that and it's kind of at the core of our uh, as we think about identity development is uh, who am I and what do I have to offer the world right um, and so let's 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 keep moving in this positive identity piece a little bit especially Heidi also because you mentioned the importance of it um, one thing I'm curious about and this was this is this struck me too as I was uh, thinking about this and, and, and a couple of points that I want to say about our data in, in other areas too is that we have found when we do developmental relationships, the developmental relationships measure, we have found the element of expanding possibilities as being one of the, 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 the lowest that are experienced by young people in schools. And so, especially over the pandemic, as we've unpacked this and I've talked to schools and worked with schools, is that I think sometimes that expanding possibility is really connected to that hope, right? It's connected to the future. It's, 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 it's expanding my world beyond the walls of this, where I am. And one group we worked with began to focus on this, like, are we messaging to our young people this idea of hope for the future, that there is idea for them to be able to create the change for the future? And one really amazing friend of mine and colleague and scholar said, Ben, one thing I grieve right now in schools is that we're not, we, we've lost, the uh, uh, young people have lost the opportunity to dream. And I think that there's something important to that. So I would love to hear a little bit about that uh, positive identity piece for both of you and ways that you've thought about intervening and helping to create systems um, uh, for your young people. And I also have to say in our data, we found that for girls, it was the 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 it was more pronounced this drop um, uh, when we talk about positive identity as well, that I think is is could be an, uh, something else that we could talk about too. So uh, Heidi, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about that uh, positive identity piece and what are some 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 things that, or if you've kind of thought of what's next uh, for how how to intervene there? Yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned the word hope. We actually have a mental health provider who has reached out to um, some of us at the Municipal Alliance saying that that the young people that are coming through his office are really, there is no hope. They, they have this lack of hope. And can we as a community start to have a conversation about how we can build, you know, that in our young people. So I'm excited that we want to start those conversations and what can we really do in the community. Um, I think one of the other things that we saw lower was um, self-esteem, hmm. um, which I know is is always a struggle, um, especially with women. I think we've also had conversations about the impacts of social media yeah. and um, those types of um, you know self-esteem issues. And one program that we have stuck through for probably the last ten programs with regard to specifically positive identity is sort of the, the view of uh, personal view of their future. Mm -hmm. And we felt it was important for young people to sort of find that spark and to find that passion in you know, their life. And so can we help them find careers and can we help them and connect them with people that they can talk to about potential careers and really feeling, or you know, what what is your path after after high school? You know, what is it that excites you? And you know, for us to be able to bring in community members to talk about 
um, you know, everything from, you know, being an electrician to, you know, being an oral surgeon, um, you know, all those um, types of facets. It just gives kids an opportunity to say, you know what, that really fascinates me. And, yeah. you know, I, I need to learn more about that. So again, that's our approach to the asset model in the community. And I'm sure with Caitlin, uh, excuse me, Catherine as well, is really to look at the assets that are lacking in our young people and to really try to uh, develop programming within our communities and within our schools that address those those deficits. Yeah, yeah, Catherine, can you get that? That's that's really really, um, I think a, a a powerful idea for us to say, what if we did start to focus on this identity, right? The stories young that, that kids tell about themselves that they pick up often from the environment that, that we all do. We internalize stories about ourselves from. The meaningful people around us often and just what are the stories what are the messages that we're putting out in the world right now or with our young people that we serve that they might be internalizing in ways and so um Catherine I'd love to hear you kind of talk about that and also your emphasis I know we talked a little bit about uh also youth voice and the way that youth have contributed in in the community and I think Heidi you mentioned this too of of, of uh, really having an opportunity, not just for the leaders and the programming, but for young people to have a voice in the conversation because they are experts of their own lives in some ways too. So I, I just wanna um, start off by saying that the positive identity assets is the million dollar question in Midland County. Um, we did see significant drops in all four of those categories from 10 to 14% drops. And that's the area our kids are struggling the most. Um, and it feels like we don't have the best, most clear answer on how to how to build those assets. That seems to be a vague area, but maybe um, as we've looked at and had different conversations, there's um, a, an organization here that focuses on teaching parents how to talk to their kids to help them build their self-worth and their self-esteem and see themselves in a positive light. There's a coalition in our community that focuses on well-being. So we have that, you know, that um, strengths-based approach and conversation happening in our community as well. Um, all of our schools are implementing social-emotional learning programs that are helping kids to look at themselves and reflect on who they are and what their strengths are. Um, and we've also looked at what are some of the external assets that could be contributing to these positive identity assets. And um, and we don't have that answer yet. That's a, a line of research that we're planning to, to dive into with our data. Um, but as kids have opportunities to try new things, are they... Um, every time that they fail, and as we like to say in, in Midland County, as they fail forward, that's a well-being term, as they fail forward, are they learning resilience? Are they learning um, that they're stronger than they thought they were? Are they finding a mission in the world that fits their skills? Um, and so we look a lot in this community at how we can connect kids to programming that gives them that opportunity. Um, and Ben, I think what you were referring to with our youth voice, uh, our community is, has a really neat opportunity and I'm sure that there are others as well, but our community foundation has a program called the Youth Action Council. And those kids come together on a monthly basis to offer grants to nonprofits, to offer grants to um, youth programs and teachers and they get to have a voice in where their community goes. They mm -hmm. look at the data. They use our data, in fact, to help direct where they're going to invest. So they can look at it and say, hey, we know that you know youth programs is an area that we haven't been able to do as much with in the last four years because of the pandemic. Um, let's invest in this program so that more kids have access to it they're driving that conversation. And mm. it's really cool to see them feel empowered. My son just joined Youth Action Council, not because of me, because it was definitely not mom's influence that mattered. But he came home the first night and he was like, mom, next month, like the first meeting, I don't get to vote because I have to learn how it works. But next month, I get to vote on how we spend all of this money. Yeah, That's a, a really unique opportunity for kids to influence. Yeah, and that I, that is so, I, I love that because when you think about the positive identity uh, parts of that, the, really the different elements of the, of, of the positive identity, 
when when there is this empowerment to or, or this ability to now act on things and to to really be able to explore whether that's a career or and you're out there and you're 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 saying well, what does this feel like for me and 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 having the confidence when you go into the when you do get access to to opportunity to to really um, act on those things and to do things and that builds that confidence too so. Yeah, that's really cool. I know we, of course, we were going to be we're going to be short on time because we we uh, always will in these conversations, and and we can have many more. I would love. I was thinking about what what maybe was a kind of final question to ask you both. I would really love for you to kind of just. Um, I like the advice question, I, and maybe it's not advice, but what is one maybe nugget of wisdom or something that you would like to to speak to the people who are listening that you know many of them are in the same boat working with youth and young people and care deeply or maybe their parents uh, what are what what are some things that you would say when uh, to them when you think about this idea of being champions of assets no pressure on this question it's like I'm happy to go first <laughs> I'm glad you no. asked because I was thinking about this actually completely coincidentally um, I have a really big philosophy of continue to invite people to the table. Um, when I took on this role 16 years ago, we had about 30 members. And in my day-to-day -day conversation as just a person, you know, that's at Starbucks and, you know, at the supermarket and, you know, in and around the community. Um, and, you know, my dad gave me the gift of gab. Thank you, dad. Mm -hmm. um, I just find myself talking about kids constantly. I think it's just a passion of mine. And when I'm talking with people who, who are like-minded, who also have an interest and perhaps maybe a profession in the field, I just invite them to our table. And what I mean by that is I invite them to our meetings. So, um, you know, we have now probably over 60 active members of our executive committee that meets five times a year. And all we talk about are youth. Hmm. And we talk about the things that we're currently doing with our young people, um, the things that we need to be doing for our young people. And what's really interesting, Ben, that most people have told me over the years is, Heidi, I think there's more business conducted after your meeting than during your meeting. Hmm. It's an opportunity for our senior citizens to get together with our elementary building principles so that they can form, you know, a, a buddy program. There are um, multiple opportunities for people of all different cross sections, again, under the veil of young people and what we can do to better their lives to just sort of get together. And sure. it's really kind of amazing that I sort of feel like it's just a matter of orchestrating mm -hmm. this community, not in the sense of, you know, egotistical here, but just sort of bringing the people together. Um, it's kind of amazing how how the it just falls into place. It's yeah, and, and especially, it. yeah, especially under the auspice, and I should really have prefaced that with really that survey data, because that's really the opportunity that opens up conversation and, you know, really puts people in a position of awe that, oh my gosh, I had no idea that, you know, 11% of our young people have attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kinds of conversations that I think um, are wonderful to have as a, as a community at large. Awesome. I love it. How about you, Catherine? I'll keep it really brief. Um, I focus on figure out what you do well as an asset builder and focus on your strengths and find people who can counter that for you or, or for the youth that you impact. I'm good with the social emotional piece. My husband is good with the thinking through problems piece. We, we help our kids in different ways mm -hmm. and that's okay. So find out what you do well and keep doing it Yeah, and I do it with that. intention. I love it. Well, thank you both for your time. I know you're very busy and the wisdom you shared today and we'll be, uh, I'm sure, um, in, in many more dialogues together. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Heidi, for your time. Um, for, everybody, thank you. for everybody else, I want to thank you for your time today as we come to a close. Um, I want to invite you to engage us. Uh, please contact uh, Mary uh, Schrader uh, if you um, are interested in understanding how you can partner more with Search Institute. Um, thank you for all you do. And I want you to, 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 um, to hear this as we go. 
um, and, and some of the themes that I heard today is that, um, again, if we can come together in collective action and create shared purpose that is, that is really centered on relationships, that together we can create a movement again, a moment in time right now where we see young people that might be struggling with their identity and having a sense of positive identity and purpose and thinking about the future. And together, we can do this work together. And I know we all care about it. Thank you. Please be well. And we look forward to working with you again in the future.